Tuesday's primary election is one of the most intriguing in quite some time. Dueling endorsements in the GOP race for governor, and Charles Franklin is the director of the Marquette Law School poll. He joins us now with some insights on what is going on. Charles, always good to see you. Thanks for being good with us. Good to be here. Thanks. This is pretty interesting, what's going on in Wisconsin. I think it's very interesting. On the Republican gubernatorial side, we have two top-tier candidates sort of going head-to-head, mm -hmm. -head. but we have Donald Trump, we have Mike Pence, we have Scott Walker, we have some other other endorsers coming in and supporting different candidates. So there's a really interesting division among past Republican leaders of the state with Walker or the country with, with Trump. Uh, both saying go for this person while the other says go for the other. This will be really interesting to see what this means for Wisconsin, who wins this race yeah. on Tuesday in terms of what it says about maybe Trump and, and how this state has reflected on the last couple years since he left office. I think it's a very interesting question because Donald Trump is certainly the predominant figure in the Republican Party nationally and is very strong here. On the other hand, Scott Walker's eight years as governor defined the modern Republican Party in the state. But he's been out of office for four years, as has Clayfish. So it's a really interesting question between the governor who revolutionized Republican politics in Wisconsin versus the president who revolutionized national party politics. Yeah, and, and is it more about the candidate or is it about those people endorsing them? I mean, is this state ready to move on past yeah. Trump? Is it ready to move on past the Walker years? It's going to be interesting to see that. I think that's a good question about moving on, but let's not downplay the importance of the candidates right. themselves. You know, endorsements might be worth two to four points for a candidate. In this case, they might be going in opposite directions and kind of cancel each other out. So your confidence in support for either of these two top, top tier candidates, I think is really an important part of the election, not just the endorsements. Now, every state is different, but we saw earlier this week how Trump endorsements and Pence endorsements yes. played out in other states, Arizona, Michigan, to name a couple, Missouri, although tr the former president wasn't so committal. He, he went for an Eric. He didn't really give which Eric he was endorsing, but how, how has it played out in other states? And it, could we see something like that here? Yeah, Trump's candidates have mostly won, though there are a few prominent exceptions to that. And I think his candidates, uh, this past week had, uh, you know, pretty good success rate. Uh, but I think the Wisconsin race is a little bit different from some of the races, not all of them, but some of them have pitted extremely pro-Trump candidates against much more reticent uh, pro-Trump candidates. And so the, the gap between the candidates maybe has been a little bigger in some of the other states. Here, you couldn't look at Clayfish or Michaels and say either is adamantly right anti-Trump. Uh, mm -hmm. It's really not that much difference. And there's also the point that among Republican primary voters, they have a generally positive impression of both Clayfish and Michaels. So it's not like one is seen very positively and the other very negatively. The political memory of people is short uh, and, and you have new populations that move into a state. You and I and many other who pay close attention to politics will remember Tim Michaels running and losing to Senator Feingold back in 2004. Are you surprised with how he's overcome, you know, 18 years kind of out of the political limelight and yeah. catching up so quickly with a recent lieutenant governor like Clayfish? No, I think eight, 18 years is a long time. Yeah. It's not just one generation, mm -hmm. it's at least two in terms of political time. Um, I think it is surprising that he could come in late and pick up as much strength as he apparently has. Mm -hmm. At least in our June poll, the two were very close, right. just one point apart. We haven't seen polling since then, so I'm not sure where that stands. But I think you have to give credit to a massive advertising campaign on the Michaels side as primarily a self-funding campaign. He was free to buy as much ad time as he wanted to. Um, but the other aspect of this is that we had seen half of the Republican electorate undecided in the spring right. and still 35% or so undecided in June. So there were a lot of voters on the table at the time that Michaels got in and therefore he didn't need to change minds so much as simply bring people into a decision, and Clayfish as well, moving some of those folks off the sidelines. Shifting gears to the Senate race, the Democratic primary, speaking of self-funding, we saw that uh, a lot with Alex Lazary and also with uh, Sarah Godlewski, the treasurer in that Democratic Senate primary. How was Mandela Barnes able to kind of push them aside so 
you know, it seemed like a tight race in polling, and then, especially with Lazary, and then all of a sudden it's just, it's a one-man show here. No, it had been very close from February through June in our data, and the Lazary campaign had put out internal polls that were within a point or two of ours, also mm -hmm, showing right. it very close. So there's a lot of evidence that it was close through June. But news reports at least say that there was a flurry of polling in July that showed Barnes suddenly pulling out to a double-digit lead. Part of that is linked again to advertising. The Barnes campaign had kept their powder dry and didn't go on the air a lot until late June. And it seems to have moved again, Democratic voters this time off the sidelines and behind him. And I think in the end, with Lazary in particular, but also Godlewski looking at solid double digit losses pending, uh, decided it was better to unify the party, take credit for helping to unify the party, maybe help yourself in future races, um, rather than continue on to the end. Remember, we saw a very divisive Democratic primary right. all the way back in 1992 that opened the door for Russ Feingold to go up the middle and, and win a big victory over two better known, better funded candidates. This year in the Democratic Senate race, they decided not to attack each other in their ads or in their debate. And here at the end, they decided to drop out and unify the party. What will you be watching as results come in Tuesday in, in parts of the state uh, in particular? In the Republican Party, there has been a persistent geographic divide between the southeast, the Green Bay area, and the north and west of the mm -hmm. state. Clayfish, in her 2010 primary for lieutenant governor, ran up the vote really strongly in the southeast while losing most of the north and the west. Back to 2004, which I'll grant you is a long time right. ago, um, we saw Michaels do especially well in the Green Bay area, but also down into some of the Milwaukee area. And again, Michaels' opponent then did better in the north and east. So right now, neither of these candidates would seem positioned to do really well in the north and east, right. north and west. So who does do well there? And finally, what about this trade-off between the Milwaukee media market, that mm -hmm. broad region around Milwaukee, and the Green Bay media market, that broad region around Green Bay? So I'm going to look at the balance between those two, and then I'll check on the uh, votes in the western part of the state, St. Croix County, and. Eau Claire and Chippewa and see who's doing well there. Well, it should be fascinating on Tuesday and, of course, well in to November as well. Charles Franklin, always great to discuss this with you. Thanks for being with us. Thank you. And we'll wrap up today's For the Record in just a moment.